All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Maloney. Excited to have you here at another one of uh, our virtual events presented by the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. We also have our presenting partner today with us, the Zuckerman Institute over at Columbia University for our ongoing series, Music on the Brain. Uh, excited to have you guys here on behalf of our executive director, Tracy Heider Suffern, together with our artistic team of Christian McBride and John Batiste. Uh, we welcome you all here for uh, what is now a full calendar year of, uh, or, or sorry, a full 365 days of, of virtual programming uh, from the National Jazz Museum in Harlem in this COVID virtual space. So we uh, really appreciate all of you tuning in. If you have an opportunity to, can you please click the little share button in the feed and, and uh, push it out to your network of friends? It really goes a long ways in helping us to broaden our reach. This series in particular uh, looks at some really interesting inter intersections between uh, brain, the brain and neuroscience and music and art and creativity and, and all kinds of really exciting things. So we know that all of your, your friends out there would love to, to learn a little bit more about this program. I want to take a minute to just acknowledge our partners over at, at uh, the Zuckerman Institute, Paula Croxon, Alyssa Mayer, and Lisa Din, who uh, without them, this program would not happen. Uh, they're instrumental in, in making all this, this happen. And I want to introduce our host for the, for the program and our, our curator, um, uh, Helen Sung, who uh, was an artist in residence at the Zuckerman a couple of years ago, which helped kick off this program. Uh, Helen, an incredible piano player and band leader and composer, and and uh, had a, recently was featured at Jazz Night in America on, on NPR. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, please do so. So I'm going to bring Helen in here. Let's see here. If I click this, it should work. Hi, Helen. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for that really awesome introduction. I can't believe 365 days of virtual programming. Yeah, it's been I, my last day at the museum was uh, March 13th. So um, wow. yeah, and we were able to transition within the first two weeks, we were able to transition to some online programming. So we're, so we're excited. And this program, we're, all, we're, we're well into our second year. So um, I just want to thank you so much for everything you've brought to the program. I'm going to I'm going to bow out and uh, we'll get things going. Well, thank you. And, you know, I just have to thank organizations like the Jazz Museum, National Jazz Museum, all these uh, different presenters that have found a way to um, just really turn on a dime really quickly and and keep artists uh, making music and sharing music. And of course, to the Zuckerman Institute for their support in all things science and tech too for me personally um just so grateful and very excited about today's program uh, i love how i'm able to explore just how we experience the world right through music through our senses different points of connection and today we're going to primarily focus on visual perception and how it's so closely tied with um what we hear, what we see and what we hear, the, the relationships. And so I usually start off with a piece of music. We're gonna do something a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna have a, a visual slideshow to go along with the music that I'm gonna play. So uh, we can cue that up. And the song that I'm gonna be playing with, uh, this, these are images that I took of a place in New Paltz, a little north of the city. Uh, called the Mohonk Mountain House. And the song I'm going to play is an old jazz standard called On a Clear Day. And the lyric goes, you can see forever. So welcome to I See Music.
thank you for on a clear day. So, um, as I said before I played the piece, um, I think uh, what we see, what we hear, closely tied together, you know, from my time at the Zuckerman Institute, I was very excited to find out that music engages our whole brain in a very comprehensive way like few other things and actually the visual part of our visual cortex where uh, what we see is processed and made into what we see, you know, that mis mystery uh, is one of the most strongly affected parts. So um, I really, before we um, bring in our guest scientists, I also just want to just put think about that that theme of what we see and what we hear. And especially in terms of music, because a lot of times when uh, I, I talk to people about concerts, they were like, oh, I went to see so-and-so play. I went to see. And so um, I think that's interesting because I think what we see and what we hear closely affected. So we have somebody today who can tell you about stuff like this, discuss in greater depth. And he's so smart. His research is so amazing. And we're just so pleased to have, please welcome Ling Bai Han, PhD candidate at the Zuckerman Institute to our StreamYard stage. And thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Helen, I have to say that the intro music is beautiful. And, and, <laughs> and you know that because, you know, my cat, she's already falling asleep like during the background <laughs> and, and she has the biggest ear. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's so funny because most most of the time when we play a concert and people fall asleep, we get upset. But I guess with a cat, it's good that uh -huh. it's not irritating the cat, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank mm -hmm. you for being here. And I would love for you to share your story about where you're from and how you came to be doing what you're doing today. Okay. Well, hi everyone, I'm Bai Han, and, and it's a great honor to be invited to this amazing event. Thanks for having me, Helen, and, and also the National Jazz Museum. Uh, so my journey in neuroscience actually starts when I was in, high, uh, in middle school. So I grew up in China, and, and as you might imagine, the school is very stressful. And, and I remember during my eighth grade, so one of, so one of the friends around me actually committed suicide. So it eighth was very- grade? Yeah. Oh my God. Ugh. Yeah, so it was very sad and actually made me think that the minds are so complicated and perhaps if I can better understand how the mind works, I can potentially help more people in need. So I, so I, yeah, so I actually started a book, uh, like, uh, like a psychology book club in the, uh, in, in the high school where everyone can actually share like psychology knowledge each week. And I also joined the peer, uh, peer mental consulting services. Then wow. later on, uh, during the college, I, I studied psychology and applied math in the computational neuroscience program in the University of Washington at Seattle, because I actually believe in the power of technology to actually solve the mission critical issues in the society, like the mental health. Mm -hmm. And and I think that because, you know, the psychology and neuroscience, they are actually pretty Asian fields uh, for over 100 years. <laughs> and, uh, and they might benefit a lot from the recent advancement in the engineering fields, uh, like, you know, the computer science, artificial intelligence, and also mathematics. So now, uh, here I am, I'm, uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Columbia University. And to continue my pursuit, and, and and I'm very like fortunate to work with top-notch researchers in the field to solve neuroscience with artificial intelligence. Amazing, because I remember from one of our discussions as we were preparing for this event, you referred to our brains as the human black box, which I thought was a great analogy. And so tell us a little bit how you use technology to try and quote unquote hack the black box or try to, un you know, come for some of the mystery of this amazing thing, the human brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you are right. The, the, the brain is kind of like a black box because, you know, when the neuroscientists, when we usually like measure things, like the, either the neuroimaging data where you put someone inside a, a functional imaging machine or the neural recording where you put the electrode on, onto certain brain regions to record directly. So those are only like an approximation of of what's really going on under the hood. So usually uh, uh, we will be inviting say human subject or, or sometimes a monkey subject to actually sit in a brain scan 
like a functional imaging machine, and we actually show them see a series of visual stimuli one by one. Well, and, let me ask you. Let me ask yeah. you. How did you come to focus on visual things? Like you know, there are, we have five senses, and so I'm curious why. Because no, I'm because I read somewhere that what we see is powerful and affecting how we feel in general. Mm -hmm. So it's was that was that accident? How you or why why visual perception or stimuli? Yeah, I feel like uh, uh, definitely I'm not saying that, you know, uh, neuroscientists working in certain fields okay. actually are more important than the other ones. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but definitely because the vision is one of the most important senses which we have. And and, and we also say that, you know, an image is worth a thousand worlds and, and, and stuff like that, meaning that uh, so... So we are very vision oriented, mm -hmm. and and also during the the evolutionary process, human are are one of the species which which actually relies on the the visual input significantly, oh. uh, and and unlike you know some animals which might you know live in the caves for for, for many years. This, and, and in that case, is their visual cortexes will be highly deg uh, like degraded. So 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 if we are uh, that kind of species maybe uh, uh, the the vision neuroscience will not be the way to go for neuroscientists to understand their brain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So back to uh, what we were talking about. So 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 when we are showing them the visual stimuli, we will be recording their brain response while they are viewing those images. But you know those data they are usually like very high dimensional and abstract and hard to conceptualize. So that's why we will be using some concept of of a representational space to actually visualize how how the brain or certain brain region actually places different concepts in the abstract high dimensional space. So this is what I'm amazed by. So you actually write computer programs that aim to kind of simulate what the brain is doing. And this next image that we're gonna, well, you wanna show us a couple of images, right? Should yes, Alisa, do you mind like putting up the slides? Thanks. So here is an example of, of two uh, two example Im images that you know a, a, a human subject might view during the fMRI, and, and and then if you go to the next slides, so so those are object concepts, right? So those object concepts uh, are 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 static data images which are feed into your brain, and then we either record your brain or we ask the humans about some behavioral questions. And here, shown here, would be a representational space of the similarity judgment by the human subject. So, for instance, uh, given the previous images, we, we can say how similar is object A, the pineapple, with the object B, a cat. So, despite, well, <laughs> yes. I don't think the cat would appreciate it if I tried to cut it open. So, yeah, very different. So, they should be very far. Can we go to the second? So, they should be very far apart. Yeah, they're like. Yeah. Yeah. Far, far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. So although they are actually recorded from a high dimensional space, the similarity between the two concepts, they are very straightforward. So if they are similar, they are proximal to each other on the representational space. If they are not similar, they will be distant from one another. So for instance, if you look at the group of human faces on the, yes, on the bottom left part, they are all clustered together because you know, they all belong to the same class. And then you look at the monkey faces, they are also clustered together, but they are close to the human face clusters. So this is something our brain does automatically. So, so, so shown here is actually a behavioral result, meaning that we are asking, asking human to organize how similar oh, they are. Okay. So, so, uh, so that's why here our, our human being, uh, so, so we will be say placing the monkey brain next to the human brains because they both have the notion of faces. Uh, faces. Oh. But, you know, look, and you look in the middle, we saw yeah, a wig. We <laughs> yeah, we saw a wig. We also oh, see a milk bottle. Apologize for the siren, it's New York, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's affecting what I'm seeing. I want to. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at all the traffic signals now. Over there. <laughs> yeah, it's a good example of how the auditory signals can also affect how you perceive the world, right? 
Wow. So the wig and the and water bottle and what? I mean, sorry, the milk bottle and what is that third thing in the? I, I think it's a, uh, like a thread of strings or something like that, where where you can knit your like oh. a scarf or something like that. Got it. So they're pretty hard to describe, like which categories to belong to. So that's why they actually lies in the middle. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. If you look at the next slides. It, it, uh, yes. So, so, so with this type of method, we can compare the representational space of different brain regions or different brains. So, for instance, here we pay attention to a specific brain region called inferior temporal cortex, which is cri which is critical for visual object uh, classification. So, if you compare the representational space of of the rep of the the neural recording data from a monkey's IT uh, cortex and compare it towards the neural imaging data from a human's IT cortex, you see that this shows striking similarity. So let me ask you, uh -huh. so with this, so the slide before, that was people saying, like consciously grouping uh -huh. these images. The, this, this picture shows what the brain is doing when they're looking at these images. Exactly, yes. So it's not as tightly clustered, is that? Yeah, I mean it's not as closely organized, or is that just showing that the brain, it's this is actually what's going on in space spaces in the brain, or no? Yeah, I think it, it's very right, right. So, so it doesn't look as clean cut as the previous one, but you still see some sort of cluster. So, for instance, the faces are all grouped together. Yes, and you can see all the animals are all grouped together, but you know they are not clustered that well. And, and there are multiple reasons behind that. So for instance, different brain regions, they actually have different functions. So for instance, certain brain regions uh, 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 actually specialize in the facial discrimination. So in, mm. that, so, so in that region, they, they, are, they have a very good job of distinguishing one human face with another human face. I see. And, and it is not the case here in the inferior temporal cortex because it's mostly for to categorize in different classes. So, so a crude discrimination is fine. So I that, see. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Amazing. So that's how we. Uh, so, so those can suggest that these two brain areas are processing the visual input in a very similar fashion. Mm -hmm. So, if you go to the next slides. So, so an important part of my research involves categorizing, say, the dynamic process of these neural responses. So it involves, we will be segmenting those neural responses uh, by episodes and extract their representational space from one time point to another. So for, for instance, as shown here, are the representational space of a monkey, a monkey brain evolving over time. So each dot you see on the right, the movie there, each dot is actually the neural response of the monkey's brain of viewing one particular images. Mm. And they are colored by different classes. We have the red as the faces, fruits as the blue, and places as the green, so on and so forth. You see that those representational space, they are evolving over time. And, and we can also visualize them in 3D, where the z-axis is the time. We see that over time, that the, the categorical information appears to be diverged. And then they, they all converge later on. So it's wait. Just, so yeah. this is showing where you actually. This is the monkey brain. This is yes, monkey so brain. So at the very bottom of the graph is when they first see it, mm -hmm. and then the the lines diverging is them categorizing mm -hmm. what. Well, I guess identifying really what they're seeing, right, or understanding yeah. what they're seeing. So yeah. I'm just curious, why does it converge again near the top? So, because you know, when you are shown the image over time, uh, your neural response will be like you know converging to back to the equilibrium. Because you know, you are oh. not you, your brain will not be always like like active when you are seeing the image. Right. So there, are, right. yes. So that's one reason. And another reason is that we are only showing the image for a specific times time slice. Right, wow. so we're not going to show the image for the entire day and, and record it. <laughs> yeah. So would you say where it's widest is when they've identified it? So, so when they are wide, uh, so, so when they are like more distinct from one another, it is the, uh, uh, so it's kind of like the peak point where the categorizations are, more, are, are most prominent. And right? so, this thing is the result of a computer program that you wrote. Yes. That's amazing to me. Okay. <laughs> well, let me, I want to, before we go on to the next slide, because I, I do want to talk about the next part. I uh -huh. think this would be an interesting place to talk about 
something, a phenomenon called synesthesia. Synesthesia, uh -huh. I say it wrong. <laughs> it's where two senses are linked somehow for some reason. Mm. Like in, in music, a lot of times composers, uh, they, they'll say they see colors, like mm -hmm. Olivier Messiaen. And then uh, mm. there was another famous uh, uh, German composer, um, Schoenberg. He affected a, a, compo a painter named Kandinsky, who, after seeing his uh, concert, a concert of Schoenberg's music, like a, a, most of a lot of his paintings afterwards were called compositions. Uh -huh. So, how does that happen? Like, because I've heard like some people will hear hear something and they might taste something or or smell hmm. something. Is that true? Or yeah, I think you know it. It is indeed. Uh a very interesting topic, the the synesthesia, uh, uh, because you know it also remains one of the open questions in the neuroscience community. So there are actually like different types of of, of synesthesia. So for instance, uh, uh, like you know, uh, uh, there are cases where some people, when they are reading some articles or some paragraphs, they actually form some sort of imagery, like a, like a patterns given those lexical meanings. And some of them, when they are like, say, say, uh, say uh, like listening to a certain auditory tune, they feel some type of texture. So even the tactile senses are affected by it as well. So, okay, well, <laughs> you know, one of the, probably the color that's most uh, associated with jazz, I would say is the blues. Uh, so to our listening audience out there, remember my question of, you know, uh, what, how does what you hear might affect what you see, you know, from past experience or what you see might affect how you hear. So I'm going to play a couple of jazz pieces um, that have to do with the blue color. And one is orange. So just listening, the first one I'll play Blue Monk uh, by Thelonious Monk. And the second piece is called Blue and Green by Bill Evans. And third piece is a piece by Charles Mingus called Song with Orange. So blue, green, orange, let's see if we, uh, knowing this and knowing this amazing information and research that we've just uh, heard about, let's see if it affects how we hear these pieces.
Okay, so you know we welcome audience input. Anything that um, you guys want want to share, please feel free to add it into the chat. And let's welcome Baihan back to the screen. And so, um, yeah. So, have you heard of those pieces before? Did, you know, I, I haven't heard this before, but you know, I can definitely feel some colors going on inside, <laughs> inside the. <laughs> You know, that last piece by Charles Mingus, it's interesting. Like he used the color orange and blue in several song titles. And I was wondering why those two, and I looked it up, actually blue mm -hmm. and orange are very uh, opposite on the color wheel. So they make each other pop. Whoa. Yeah, like apparently a lot of advertising uses blue and orange. So everybody <laughs> beware blue and orange. <laughs> yeah. So let's I talk about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I also find, you know, it has a cultural component inside because different color actually means different things in different culture. So that's true. That's yeah, true I, because mm. in, in China, like, I think people wear red at weddings, mm. whereas white is here in the U.S. They wear white at funerals in China, right? And it's black here. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and also I feel like it's also connected to the synesthesia because, you know, uh, uh, one of the theory behind the synesthesia is that Actually, uh, uh, there might not be some physiological like anomaly or anything like that. Sometimes people are just finding semantic meanings behind, like so, like based on certain sensory input. For instance, some people might have a strong like emotional feeling for certain type of color, and they also have emotional feelings for for certain type of say auditory tune, something like that. So that's why they they happens to have a similar semantic meanings inside of their brain. So that's also one hypothesis that people actually come up with. That black box, that the ultimate black box. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about how you write computer programs. Like I know, I remember, I think this particular scientist had more, he had a mechanical engineering background, but he was, he said something that you said. He said to me that if you can build it, that means you understand it. So. <laughs> I know that's probably simplistic, sorry, but <laughs> it's in the ballpark. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, uh, uh, I also heard something similar. So it's by the uh, the famous physicist Richard Feynman. So he said that what I cannot create, I cannot understand. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So basically, it is also the similar thing. So we are also trying to, like, you know, reverse engineering the brain to understand the mechanism behind all, uh, many, like, neural computations. So do you want to show that amazing slide? Yeah, of course, the... yes. Yes. Yeah, so basically it, it is a schematic. So in the long term, we, what we would want to have is to create say, a mechanistic model that mimics every brain regions. So, uh, so recent study have shown that say deep neural networks, which are widely used in many real world applications, it demonstrate a very similar representational space in the object uh, uh, related tasks with that of the human brain. So ideally, we would want to have find out, say, a one-to-one -one mappings from certain computational modules in, say, a deep neural network or too many brain regions we are interested in. So basically, that's the main ideas behind that. So basically, you're creating something that will replicate a certain brain activity, a brain, certain brain function, like your area of what you see, maybe also what you hear. Is that is that what this um, what this is you saying is a schematic, a plan, a representation of, I guess. Yeah. So basically, there are like two two, two outcomes which can kind of come from this set of methods. So one way would be that how can we develop, say, better artificial intelligence models, which in the real life, right? So despite the fact that in many uh, like daily life we are already relying on those intelligent systems. Many systems are very bulky and actually they use a lot of computational resources. But our human brain during the evolutionary process can do a similar task with a similar accuracy or performance with, a very, with thousands of magnitude smaller resources. Yeah. So if we can better understand the brain, we can build better AI systems. And, other, and on the other hand, well, now we are also trying to test different type of computational series for the different brain components. And, and, and by comparing them, we're not comparing, like you mentioned, simply on the brain response, since you know, computational models, they actually do not have neural response. They have other type of, say, activations in, in some computational units, or they might have some other type of output. 
But despite the fact that we cannot com compare them accordingly, we can compute, uh, we can compare their representational space. So meaning that when we feed them with the same set of say visual stimulus uh, images, for, for instance, I show the humans 10 different images. I can also show uh, an, an AI model, like 10 different images. And then I extract the similarity graphs of all those but so basically when I mean similarity graph, I mean the representational space, how similar the response patterns between different type of uh, different pairs of, 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 of images, image input. So from that information, we can compare them accordingly. So I can understand for the sake of pure research, like AI, like what are, why AI? Like wh why, what are some other reasons or benefits that you see in doing this type of research? You mean benefit on the neuroscience? Uh, uh, for, for humanity? I mean, I guess yeah. scientific research, it, it it can be for its purely for its own sake, right? Or, yeah. or because is science looking, does it care about like application in the real world or things like that? Yes, definitely, because for instance, when we are, uh, so, so when we are building a computational models that tries to mimic certain part of the brain regions or mimics how the brain is performing certain tasks, we, we have the mechanisms, mechanistic, we have the mechanisms of the computational models because we actually build them ourselves. Mm -hmm. So given that, we can also simulate, say, say anomalies from those type of mm. task, behavioral tasks. For instance, mm. oh, if we have a computational model that, that helps uh, explain how the brain are, are, are say, say learning from a sequence. And then maybe when we, uh, uh, we can also unfold, say, say, say different type of mental disorders, which are also doing the similar task. Mm. For instance, we can, we can build a model where we can artificially tweak around different hyperparameters, which drives the model to do diff different things. The so set can mimic a mental what are, what are hyperparameters? Okay, sorry. The hyperparameters. <laughs> so consider, say, the artificial intelligence models or or computational models as a mechanic uh, as a mechanic machine, right? Okay. So those mechanic machine, we can actually tweak on different parameters. For instance, I can oh. uh, I can switch on, say, the, I, I can turn on different type of power, the, mm -hmm. the electrical power to power this machine. Or, or I can use like different size of, of the components to, to actually drive this machine. So those are the degree of freedoms that we can, we can modify our mechanic models to simulate a different process. Say we are building a robots and the robots can have say different arm lengths or, mm -hmm. or they can have different type of sensors, big sensors, small sensors like their eyes. And, and maybe I want to, uh, so, so now we are basically having building kind of like a robot to mimic the human performing certain tasks. Got it. And, and Got it. then we can change the components of the robots to also mimic how a human do things in, in other conditions, say Parkinson's disorders. Maybe oh. we want the robot to also walk in a, in a certain type. Then we can know, okay, if these components, uh, so basically, uh, so that's how it connects with like different type of mental health. Amazing. Yeah, I just am so inspired by what you said about your original, this, the inspiration that came to you to why to study the brain and the, and the, and the amazing, the power of the mind, like you said. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, well, let's, let's get back to like what we see affecting how we hear and what we hear affecting what we see. And, and, uh, I, I want to really encourage those who might be tuning in to chime in because we're going to have some uh, activities. But tell us a little bit because you've done some experiments or you know you you're familiar with the research um, in terms of because, you know, as a musician, a lot of times um, teachers, teachers have said, you know, you should memorize this music. You shouldn't have to look at it when you're playing because it actually prevents you from focusing fully on the music. And I think sometimes when we listen to music, we close our eyes. So yeah. tell us a little bit about. Yeah, Science. that's definitely the case because you know, uh, uh, so so it's actually two ways, like uh, like the prompt are saying. So the vision definitely affects how we actually perceive the music. So 
So previously, there are many studies in the, in the field on the differences of the auditory skills between, say, sighted individuals versus the blind individuals. And, and for, for instance, the, the blind people are reported to have, say, greater like expertise in, in various auditory tasks, like you know, spatial navigation, uh, location, or pitch discrimination. So that's why many musicians there sometimes have some, some sighted problem. So that is also uh, possible for this type of things. So another interesting finding is that the blind people, they actually, uh, the blind individuals, they actually show greater amygdala activations in response to say emotional segments when they are listening to the music comparing to those sighted people. So we know that the amygdala is the, is the part of the limbic system which actually uh, uh, like, uh, like engage in say, associated with emotions or instinct like fight or fright. Mm -hmm. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. So, can we bring up that slide with the the mystery faces? Oh, okay. So that's actually a a, a different story because you know. Uh, uh, so, so shown here is uh, an example of of uh, 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 how the music can also change your visual perception. Mm. So, so the the reason behind this. Uh, so here, uh, uh, they actually recruited different individuals and show them like different type of images. And many of them are noisy images with no faces on them. Some when you say them, noisy images, you mean like all that grayness, like yes. cause it's not distinct and clear and sharp. Like, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And some of them, they have a, a happy smiley face and some of them, they have a sad face and some of them, they only have a circle. They have no faces. Mm -hmm. and, and then they will be playing like different type of music that elicitate different type of emotions mm -hmm. for those individuals. And, and they find out that uh, uh, so it, it affects how they perceive a, a face is there or not. So, ba so basically, if you are listening to a happy music, and your more like your accuracy of of predicting whether or not it is a happy face will be much higher. So if so, basically, if your what you see aligns with what you hear, you will have a better chance to make a correct prediction. But there are also cases where, uh, comparing to not hearing any music, they are they happens to be more likely to see faces when there is not. So, <laughs> based yeah. on what they're hearing, right? Yeah, based on what they're hearing. Exactly. Amazing. Amazing. Well, let's do a little experiment with our audience. Um, I'm going to play some music, then we're going to have some images up and two. It's going to be choosing between two. And just as you listen to the music, um, maybe inter we would love to uh, for you to, to hear your response. But which which. Uh, image connects more strongly to the music and why. So here's the first one. Anybody want to chime in? So what you just heard, which image would you associate it more strongly with? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about these two images. One is by Kandinsky, who I talked with about, uh, talked about 
at the beginning of the program, someone who heard Schoenberg's music, Arnold Schoenberg's music, and then uh, his, his paintings after that really uh, reflected that experience. A lot of them were called composition. Ah, Carla Vallée, Kandinsky image. Yay, awesome, because the piece that I just tried to play <laughs> was that first piece. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, that uh, Kandinsky heard, and it's by Schoenberg. Klavierstück. Yes, at first I thought the Picasso, but the more abstract and fast with music. Yeah, yes, and the Picasso to me is, oh, you guys are sharp. The Picasso to me is very representational. Uh, you know, it's obviously a pair. This is probably early in Picasso's career. Uh, and the music, you know, Schoenberg was the pioneer of 12-tone music, abstract uh, concepts of music. Okay. Wow, y'all are awesome. Let's go to the second set of images. Oops, I forgot to switch mics for that one. I hope you were able to hear the music. <laughs> okay, any uh, thoughts for that selection? Flower, yeah. Very nice. That piece that I played is by Billy Strayhorn um, called A Flower is a Lovesome Thing. Okay, I'm going to get this piano mic settled this time. I, I have to switch back and forth because of the wonderful mysteries of electricity and tech. Okay, here's the third set. Thank you. 
Okay, how about that one? The winding road, beautiful greenery. Okay, thank you for that. The forest path feels like a journey. <laughs> Exploratory, the nature trail. I love it. You know, it's so funny because any more before we, that piece is by Jerry Allen is called feed the fire. And I actually was thinking the sunset because of the fire, but I love it. You know, this is so great. Um, how we see things, how we feel things, how we hear things. Ah, the sunset, more dynamic, energetic, though somewhat subdued. Okay, Ralph. Yeah. But I love this because there's, there really is no right or wrong answer, right? Because um, that's something I love about jazz music. You know, I come from the classical tradition where uh, it's very soloistic, but with jazz, you're making music with people who see the world differently, hear the world differently, experience the world differently. So I love it. I love that you heard the journey in that too, because I definitely, you know, there's a journey in that piece too. Um, so thank you for sharing your responses. I love it. So uh, let's welcome Baihan back to our spring yard. And yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about the yeah. So in, in movies and stuff, it's sometimes, sometimes a little, AI sometimes usually is not as, ben, benef, what is it, beneficent or <laughs> benevolent? Benevolent, yeah. All right. So, I heard that AI, they, they determined it was having AI that Yeah, definitely. Yes, so basically, uh, uh People are creating AI just to replace professional musicians like you to make it job <laughs> this. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I so I'm gonna show a piece of music. Uh, uh, if Ryan, you can help put up the slides. So basically, uh, I I would find you know in the future it'd be quite interesting to also to, to also record professional musicians like you know Helen. You can uh, you are invited into like a brain scan while you are performing or composing the music. We can that would be a brain. very big fMRI machine though. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that there'll be caps in the future that we just wear, um, right? Okay, so yes. go ahead. <laughs> yes, and then we also have, say, the AI model, so your neural network also performing the music, same set of music, or also composing the music on the same side. And we can compare your brains, the representational space, to see how similar they are. Are they doing the same thing, or are they just, like, you know, mechanistically pr producing something? So, so let's leave to the audience to actually decide. So shown here is actually a, an AI model by the Google where they actually trained on a bunch of data set. Uh, basically, so, so basically it was trained on, on, on over 1,000 pieces of professional uh, skilled pianist in the Yamaha com competitions. And then it learns, somehow learns to perform the music and compose on the side with expressive timing and dynamics. So, Wait, so this neural uh -huh. network here, that's uh -huh. what Google built. Uh -huh. And the user input is what you were saying from the Yamaha competitions. Yes. And then who created this digital signal processor? That's the person I'm going to be angry with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, is that I you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, th so then they, they, I guess the processor is for this this neural network to actually create the signal, which is the music that we're about to hear created by AI. Yes. So I think for this thing, let's close our eyes maybe and listen. And I want to, I, I'm curious because I have my strong opinions of what it sounds like and I'd want to hear your opinion too. Okay, so let's let's hear this piece. So Baihan, I want to, 
I want to hear what you think about that as you listen to it. Well, I feel like it has some local characteristics of of what the human pianists will be playing, but it definitely you know because you know they are actually. Uh, they are actually outputting random sequences, so there is no input inside this trend model. So that's why it's definitely like some, say, long-term coherence where uh, a human composers would be having, say, a story in mind. Maybe I want to create a storyline and I want to have some sort of peak in the middle. I'm not seeing that in the current level of AI yet. Well, to our listeners in the audience, you know, if you hear, I, I, we would love to hear your comments on what you just heard. But, I, you know, I really agree with you, Baihan. I think the word random is what I would choose. There's um, needs more dynamic variation. Yeah. And it's also like they'll start an idea but not continue it and they'll go on to something else. And it all sounds right, but not quite. <laughs> So you are still safe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for hopefully another 100 years at least. Okay, so thank you. I mean, this has been such an amazing time just talking with you. And I'm very excited. Like, I think this is the first time where our guest scientist also contributes artistically. We're going to end the program with um, some photographs that Baihan took. Baihan is a budding uh, photographer. I think this is the from the first roll of film you've ever developed. Yes. Which is super cool. And I'm going to play music to it. You know, something I noticed, I, I, he sent me a bunch of photos and I noticed trees are in a lot of them. So I'm choosing two pieces, uh, Point Sienna, which is, which means song of the tree. And then all God's children got rhythm. So we hope you enjoy this joint presentation um, from today's program. I hear music.
So thank you again. We want to thank Bahan Ling for joining us and being our guest scientist for the month. I hear your voice, of course, the Jonathan Institute team, who are so awesome to work with, giving us this beautiful forum and the National Jazz Museum in Harlem for hosting. And we'll welcome back Ryan. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, Alan Bahan, thank you so much. Let me turn your echoes off, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Again, another another program that just opens up all kinds of, of new ways of thinking about, you know, not only the music, but our brains and how our brains are so complex. And, um, you know, when you were talking about the, uh, you know, measuring um, brain activity while you're creating music, you may have seen... Um, uh, a young man, uh, a blind piano player who actually did that. I don't know if it was, was that at Columbia? It may have been where they actually put him in, in the machine and he was playing while Matthew Whitaker, who's oh, uh, yeah, from yeah. over in New Jersey. Yes. And, um, and they were, you know, doing some examination of how his brain was working while he was playing inside the big machine. And it was, all this stuff is fascinating. Um, yeah. So I just, you know, thank you guys all for for um, you know again bringing your expertise and your your music and your creativity behind with the photographs. It was absolutely amazing. And our friends at at Zuckerman again, this would this program would not happen without them. So Paula and Alyssa and Lisa behind the scenes who are making this all happen. We do have a session scheduled for for next month. Um, you can check jmih.org backslash events to find out when and where that that's happening um but yeah thank you guys any other closing closing comments that you guys want to share with us about any work you have coming up or anything you want our audience to know about i just want to say thank you for the organizer and also thank you for all the audience <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you guys were so great today and um just really uh, next month is uh jazz history month it uh, what one is brain awareness is that this month or or I forget. I'm getting an indication that it is this month. So oh, Brain Awareness Month. Yes. Right now. Oh, gosh. And so, I mean, awesome. You know, thank you to the Zuckerman Institute. I I just, just opportunity to just, just to keep dialoguing with super smart folks and scientists about the brain is um, really fantastic. So, you know, our brains are precious. Take care of them. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your communities. And we will see you again. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.